Now. Good evening. <laughs> Once again, a word of thanks to all of you for coming. I know the sacrifices that you have to make in your busy lives in order to organize your schedules to be here. So uh, thanks for making those sacrifices. The last couple of nights have certainly been really, really rewarding for me personally and, and for those that I've talked to. So I'm so glad that you're here tonight. Uh, we'll continue. Uh, Sunday night we talked about encountering Christ in the sacrament of baptism. Last night we talked about encountering Christ in the sacrament of reconciliation. And tonight we'll talk about encountering Christ in the Eucharist. So as we begin, why don't we all stand? Let's take a moment, let's greet those around us. Maybe introduce yourself by name. I'm Steve. Hi, I'm Father Tim. <laughs> nice to meet you. <laughs> And why don't we be begin with an opening song, and tonight we'll use number 310 in our Breaking Bread issue. Number 310. Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Good and gracious God, we have cause to praise and thank you every day because you are faithful beyond our imagining. You sent us your Son, Jesus Christ, to show us your love and to show us how to love one another. And he promised before he returned to you that he would remain with us always, even until the end of time. Good and gracious God, it's in the Eucharist where your Son, Jesus, is again faithful to that promise to always be with us. In fact, Lord, in all the sacraments, he fulfills that promise to be near to us. Lord, we ask that you fill our hearts tonight with the spirit of Eucharist, with a heart of thanksgiving. We ask, Lord, that you open our hearts and open our ears. Help us to be attentive to Emily Bessel, whom you have sent us as teacher and guide. We ask, Lord, that you continue to anoint her with your spirit. We ask these things, Lord, in the name of Jesus, your Son, who lives and who reigns forever and ever. Amen. We invite you to be seated for a moment. My mom has two folders full of them, just those paper folders with the pockets, you know. They're crammed full of them. She's got them held together with a piece of elastic and she keeps them on the bottom shelf of her pantry cupboard. Two folders filled with instruction booklets. 
instruction booklets on every appliance and every gadget that she ever bought, instruction booklets for lawn mowers that we long ago sold, and weed whackers that don't whack anymore, and curling irons, and hair dryers, and vacuum cleaners. She's got them going all the way back, you can't even imagine, instruction manuals that my dad probably never even looked at, because us guys, we don't read the instructions, you know. <clears throat> Sunday night and Monday night, Emily Bessel talked to us about the instruction manual, about the instructions for, for the rite of baptism and the instructions for the rite of penance, documents that most of us don't have, and those of us who have them don't pay a whole lot of attention to them. And from there, she brought to us great wisdom and great insight about the sacraments that are ours. She does that because she's a woman of great knowledge and a woman of great faith, and she's a great teacher. Emily Bessel has been a teacher for the church for over 30 years. Um, she teaches college students on the campus at Xavier as an adjunct professor, and how blessed we are, even though we're not college students or anything else. How blessed we are to have her here tonight with us uh, to speak to us about the sacrament of the Eucharist. Please join me again in welcoming Emily Besser. Thank you. Thank you for that nice welcome. How's this for the microphone? If my scarf shifts around, I'll have to fix it, so let me know if it falls down gets too far away. Well, welcome back for another of our evenings reflecting on the sacraments here. Um, tonight, as Father said, we'll be thinking about and talking about the Eucharist. But first, I have a question for you. What day is it today in the church year? Feast of the Annunciation. Do you want to use that feast day um, to uh, that's using, especially that story from Luke's Gospel, that's the Gospel for Mass for today. Uh, use that story to focus our reflection on the Eucharist tonight. That story tells of an encounter between the angel Gabriel and the Virgin Mary. An encounter between them. And I want to use that story of that encounter to deepen our understanding of the encounter that we have with Christ, with God and the Holy Spirit, at Mass. It might seem a bit odd, but I think we can find a lot of parallels between uh, that Annunciation story and the Mass, between what God does and what we do, and taking Mary as our model. The basic framework of that Annunciation story that we're all very familiar with is one of a meeting, an encounter, a dialogue between Mary and the angel. This dialogue is initiated by God. God is the one who sends the angel to Mary. And God speaks to Mary in that passage through an angel. And Mary responds to this message from God that she receives. And I would say that, in a nutshell, that's what we do every time we celebrate the Eucharist. God speaks to us, and we respond back to God. We have a liturgy of the Word with readings from Scripture and preaching where God speaks. We have a liturgy of the Eucharist where we respond back to God. God speaks to us in the Eucharist, in the liturgy of the Word, not through an angel, although sometimes we might think that would be nice. God doesn't speak through an angel, but he speaks through these Bible readings the Bible readings that are laid out throughout the church year for us. He speaks to us through those passages that are read to us by our parish lectors, deacons, by the pastor, and we respond to God. Ideally, we respond to God like Mary did, and that's what I want to talk about later tonight. First, though, this passage from Luke's Gospel about the Annunciation begins with a greeting. You probably can think of how it goes. Hail, full of grace, the Lord is with you. 
that sound familiar from that passage? And does that sound familiar to, not just from the Hail Mary, because of course that's the beginning of that prayer, but that greeting, the Lord is with you, the Lord be with you. Does that sound familiar? That's the greeting that we hear at the beginning of Mass and at some other times too. The Lord be with you. There are other variations of it uh, that we can use at Mass, all taken from the scriptures. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all is one option. Or grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Or another option is this just simply, the Lord be with you. So the Annunciation story starts with the greeting, like how Mass starts with the greeting near the beginning. As Mary's encounter with Gabriel begins, so does our encounter with Christ, with God, in the Mass. In the Annunciation passage, that greeting troubled Mary. Do you remember that part of the story? She was greatly troubled at what was said, and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. Remember that part of the passage? She's troubled at the greeting. And sometimes I think, maybe we should be troubled when we hear the greeting at Mass, too. Not in the sense of being frightened, but more like the second part of that line from that passage, pondering what sort of greeting this might be. Wondering what's, what this is, trying to realize what's happening in that greeting at Mass. Maybe we've become so used to these words, so accustomed to say in our response, that we no longer wonder or ponder about that greeting. All the uh, directions for how to celebrate Mass are contained in a document of the Catholic Church called the General Instruction of the Roman Missal. And that document says this about the greeting. Then, by means of the greeting, the priest signifies the presence of the Lord to the assembled community. By this greeting and the people's response, the mystery of the church gathered together is made manifest. I thought it was just saying hi. <laughs> It's not just, good morning, everyone, good morning, Father. There's much more going on than what we see or hear. The greeting is the visible, or in this case, probably audible sign, but there's an invisible, inaudible reality that's happening there. The greeting is sacramental. Listen to, the, again, the way that the general instruction talks about it. By means of the greeting, the priest signifies the presence of the Lord. The presence of the Lord is signified in that little exchange. The Lord be with you and with your spirit. Signifying the presence of the Lord. God is here. Christ is here. That greeting is saying. The passage from the general instruction also says, The mystery of the church gathered together is made manifest. The mystery of the church gathered together. Christ is present in his body, the church. This gathering, when, when we gather to celebrate Eucharist, this gathering is not just some ordinary group of people getting together to do whatever it is people do when they get together. But this community, when you gather for Eucharist, when any Christian community gathers for Eucharist, you are gathered as the body of Christ. The mystery of the church is revealed in that creed. Christ is present in the priest who is leading the community, leading this greeting, and in the rest of the body of Christ who respond to that greeting. So perhaps we should be like Mary sometimes at the greeting, not be troubled as if we're afraid of something, but in awe, in wonder at what that greeting means, that Christ is present with us, the Lord is here with us, and that we gather as Christ's body. After that greeting in the Annunciation story, God speaks to Mary through the angel, through the messenger of the angel. Well, that's what happens at Mass, too. God speaks to us in the Liturgy of the Word. 
through the Bible readings that are given, through the readings as they're arranged in the church here in the lectionary, through the people from the community who proclaim that word to us. Those readings are God's word to us. Just as the greetings signify God's presence, so too do the readings. We get a little hint of that at the end of the reading. Can you think of what uh, the lector for the first and second reading says at the very end of the text when they're finished with the Bible passage? What do they say? The word of the Lord. The word of the Lord. It's not a word about the Lord. It's the word of the Lord. It's God's word spoken to us when we gather together. We often take ritual words for granted, don't we? We get so used to accustomed to them, they just kind of fall off our lips or we just hear them uh, as a routine. It, sometimes it seems like it's just a script. Okay, the reading's over. I say the word of the Lord. They say, thanks be to God. But there's a, a, a great uh, meaning in there that God is speaking to us. It is God's word here and now to this assembly every time we hear these passages. The general instruction of the Roman Missal says, in the readings, God speaks to his people. So we're not just listening to these Bible passages for um, a history lesson or to get some information about a Bible passage. Uh, it, it's not a matter of learning about something else. It's an it's a event of communication. God is speaking to us. God is present speaking to us. The Constitution on the Liturgy from Vatican II said, In the liturgy, God is speaking to his people, and Christ is still proclaiming his gospel. Do you ever think of that during the gospel readings, that the Jesus that we hear about in the gospel, who once walked this earth and preached his gospel, is still doing that. He continues to preach his gospel when the gospel is read at church. Christ is still proclaiming his gospel. <coughs> if you think about that, the gospel in particular, I think you can um, get a, a, a sense that Christ is really speaking to us from the things that we say at the beginning and the end of the gospel. So if you think about um, when the uh, first part of the, the passage goes, the Lord be with you, with your spirit, reading from the Holy Gospel, and then what do we say? Glory to you. We don't just say glory to Christ, glory to God. We say glory to you. We're talking right to him as if he's there. Because we believe he is. Present to us through his word. And at the end of the uh, gospel, the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus. Christ. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. So again, um, like with the first and second reading, when we say thanks be to God, you could say that if you were talking to God or not. Like if I were going to tell you about some great thing that happened to me, I might relate the story and say, and then this happened, thanks be to God. But I'm not really talking to God then, I'm talking to you about something. But that line from the gospel, that's unmistakable, isn't it? Praise to you. So it, those little um, responses that we as a community have in Eucharist, glory to you, praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ, at the beginning and end of the gospel, just reinforces our faith, our belief, that Christ is still proclaiming his gospel. He's present speaking to us, proclaiming his gospel when we gather for the liturgy. Gabriel's word to Mary was about how Christ would be present in this world through her in a unique way. But the word that's addressed to us when we gather to celebrate the Mass is also about how Christ is present in our lives and in our world. It's different from Mary because Mary would conceive, uh, have uh, carry the baby, he would be conceived in her by power of the Holy Spirit. So it's different. But yet, there's a similarity, too, in that Christ is also going to be present uh, to us through this word. The word that we hear from the Bible passages at Mass help us remember and recall what God has done in the past. 
Because those are stories written a long time ago, right? The Bible stories. So we hear them, again, not for history, but we remember what God has done in the past so that we can be aware of and attentive to what God is doing now. What God is doing in our time, in our place, in our world. The Bible reads tell us what God has done in the past so, and what God will continue to do. What God is doing among us even in the present time. So the readings are always about hope or promise. That God who once acted in biblical times is still active in our world today. On our own personal lives and in the world at large. So like God's word to Mary in the Annunciation, the Bible readings always bring a sense of hope and of promise. After Mary hears the message from the angel, hears God's message to her, she responds. And this is perhaps the most well-known part of this Bible story. Do you remember Mary's response? Behold, I am the handmaid of the Lord. May it be done to me according to your word. A familiar prayer, right? A familiar passage. May it be done to me according to your word, she says. An acceptance. An agreement. That she'll cooperate with what God has, has uh, in plan for her. Um, a way of saying yes. I think of um, uh, the phrase buy-in. I was part of a group one time that had a lot of Procter & Gamble people in it, and they would always talk about it. we got to get buy-in. we got to get buy-in. Meaning an agreement from others. So Mary's buy-in in there. It's her yes. And I would say it's also a way of saying amen. That word amen. Mary's let it be, uh, the Latin word fiat, let it be, is basically the same meaning as amen. So be it. So be it. It's not just a let it be in an abstract way about something out there somewhere. But Mary's let be is let it be done to me according to your word. Her let it be is like signing your name on the dotted line, agreeing to what's been asked of you. It's a count me in, I'm in on this plan. Or as the responsorial song for Mass today says, uh, from Psalm 40, I believe it is, Here I am, Lord, I come to do your will. That's like, behold the handmaid of the Lord, may it be done to me according to your word. Here I am, Lord, I come to do your will. <laughs> we say amen a number of times at Mass, don't we? We say that a lot. There's two really important times that we say amen that occur in the liturgy of the Eucharist. One comes at the end of the Eucharistic prayer when we say, or probably most often sing, Amen. And then Amen when we receive communion. And I want to spend the rest of the time talking about those two. Our response to the Word of God in the liturgy of the Eucharist comes in the form, uh, at first, of the Eucharistic prayer. The Eucharistic prayer. And uh, we mentioned this the other night. The word Eucharist comes from a Greek word that means Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. So that's our response to God. Whatever it is that God has said to us through the readings, proclaimed in the liturgy of the word, our response is, thank you, God. Our response is, is thanks. A response of, of, of thanks to God for the first two readings, for Christ and the gospel. But our response in the liturgy of the Eucharist, our way of saying thank you, is never just a matter of just the words. Never just a matter of saying thank you. When we give God thanks in the Eucharistic prayer, we are joining in Christ's giving of thanks to his Father in heaven. And you can tell that, that we're joining Christ in giving thanks from the end of the Eucharist. Remember how the Eucharistic prayer ends? Through him, with him, and in him. And who's the him? Jesus Christ. 
So in that, um, through him, with him, and in him, who are we talking to? God the Father. We're talking to God the Father through and with and in Jesus Christ. So we're joining Christ in his giving thanks to his Father in heaven. We're being inserted into Christ giving thanks to God. We're plugged into his gratitude. And how does Jesus Christ give thanks to God the Father? He gives thanks in words, but not just words. He also gives his very self. He gives his life to God. He gives himself totally, fully, like he did on the cross. In the liturgy of the Eucharist, Christ is continuing his self-offering, his eternal giving of himself to his Father. And he draws us into that self-gift. He's giving thanks to God by giving himself to God the Father, and he pulls us into that relationship, into that self-gift, especially in the Eucharistic prayer. Here's the general instruction on the Roman Missal again. It's talking about the Eucharistic prayer. The meaning of the prayer is that the whole congregation joins Christ in confessing the great deeds of God and in the offering of sacrifice. You see that through him, with him, and in him in that line? The whole congregation joins Christ in confessing the great deeds of God and in the offering of sacrifice. The part where it's talking about confessing the great deeds of God, um, confessing, you might think, has to do with, like last night's talk, telling your sins, but confessing also means to proclaim. So Christ is proclaiming the great deeds of God. And the first part, the first half or so of a Eucharistic prayer is always a telling a story of great things God has done for us. Listen, uh, if you're here tomorrow night at Mass or the next time you're at Mass, the first part of a Eucharistic prayer, and you'll hear that it's a telling of story. And Jesus is telling the great things that God has done, and we're joining in telling that great story. So the whole congregation joins Christ in confessing the great deeds of God, and what was that other part? Offering sacrifice. Now what's the sacrifice? that we're offering in the Eucharistic prayer. What sacrifice is happening? It means a lot of things. The general instruction again. This is a little bit longer quote, but stick with me, I think it's worth it. The church, in particular, the church here and now gathered, offers the sacrificial victim in the Holy Spirit to the Father. And who's the victim, the sacrificial victim? Jesus. Jesus Christ. The church's intention, indeed, is that the faithful, that's the baptized people, the faithful not only offer this victim, but also learn to offer their very selves. So day by day to be brought through the mediation of Christ into unity with God and with each other so that God may at last be all in all. Isn't that a great little paragraph there? So the sacrifice, part of the sacrifice is offering the sacrificial victim to God the Father. It's the sacrifice of Christ on the cross that's being uh, continued in the celebration of the Eucharist. But what's another part of the sacrifice? Who else is being offered to God? All of us. We learn to offer our very selves. In union with Christ, to God the Father, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we offer ourselves to God. In thanksgiving, we offer our lives. Did you notice the last part of that um, thing I just read from the general instruction? They offer their very selves, and so day by day they're brought through Christ into unity with God and with each other. Does that sound like anything you've heard recently? We talked about that last night. God's plan of reconciliation.
So God is furthering that plan by having community celebrate Eucharist. So that little by little, we're brought more and more into unity with God and with each other by celebrating the Mass. So that finally, God is everything. That last line is from one of the epistles, I always forget which one, so that God may at last be all in all. So the sacrifice has to do with offering our very selves. And at the end of the prayer, what do we say and sing? Amen to that. And sometimes I think if we would uh, talk to uh, Catholics as they come out of their churches on Sunday, do you realize you just gave your life away? Most of us would have no idea. I thought I was just doing some prayers. But when we say amen, we are promising and joining in that sacrifice. Eucharistic Prayer 3 has a beautiful line in the middle of it where it says, Remembering Jesus' uh, death and resurrection and waiting for him to come again, we offer you, you know this line? We offer you, in thanksgiving, this holy and living sacrifice. We offer you, in thanksgiving, do you see how that's a response to God? What God has done for us is wonderful, and so in response, we offer, in thanksgiving, this holy and living sacrifice. So what's the holy and living sacrifice? It's a lot of things. We've already mentioned at least two of them. Um, but on the, on the surface, what we're doing in the Holy Living Sacrifice is we're offering first our words in the prayer that we offer. Thank you, God, is what we're saying in the Eucharistic prayer. So first we offer, um, I think it's Eucharistic prayer four, calls the prayer a sacrifice of praise. Isn't that a great phrase? We're offering a sacrifice of praise. So on the first surface level, that's the words we say in the prayer. And who says most of the words to the Eucharistic prayer? The priest does, Father does. But do we have any of the words? Yes, we do. The Sanctus, the Holy, 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 those are part of the prayer. It's not just a little intermission or a break in the prayer. We sing a hymn, okay, then we go back to Father saying the prayer. The Holy, Holy, Holy is part of the prayer. And who says that? We do. So, so we as uh, the congregation says part of the prayer. Also, the acclamation with the mystery of faith and that amen at the end. So it's our prayer that we all offer together with one another and together with the priest and together with Jesus Christ. We offer the words of thanks in the prayer. What else is on the altar that we're offering to God? bread and wine. We offer the bread and wine. And that has to do, of course, in a few moments, that, that will be changed into the body and blood of Christ in, in the Eucharistic prayer. But it's also connected to us. And how can you tell that bread and wine is connected to us at Mass? Where does it come from before it gets up to the altar? From the congregation. It comes from the congregation. That's something that, uh, a part of the Mass that was restored in the reforms of Vatican II as an important part of the meaning of the Mass. Before the reforms of Vatican II, the priest just had the bread and wine on his credence table on the side and he was putting on the altar. But after Vatican II, when the Mass was reformed, they said we need to put back in this procession with the gifts where the bread and wine comes from the assembly. And why is that? Is it just make a nice little pretty procession to have? No. Is it just something, I don't know, just makes it a little more ceremonial? No. Why does the bread and wine come from where we all sit? Because it's about us. It's coming from us. It's our lives being placed with Christ on the altar, ready to be offered to God. And so in the Eucharistic prayer, that's part of the holy and living sacrifice that we offer. Our words of thanks, the bread and wine, and as we've said, Christ's sacrifice on the cross and all of us, our very selves, the church here and now gathered. So when we sing or say our amen to the Eucharistic prayer, that's not just some simple agreement. 
as if in the sense of, um, well, that idea is true. You know, you could agree with something theoretically or principle out here. But our amen is like Mary's response. Let it be done to me according to your word. That we let what we just pray apply to me. It's about us. Not in a narcissistic sense. As if we want the focus to be on us instead of on the God that we worship. Sometimes you'll hear um, some people critique the liturgy after Vatican II and say, oh, like listen to those hymns. It's, we are the body of Christ. We are this. We are God's work of our It's too much about the people. The focus should be on God. Well, it should. But when, when the focus is on us, as I'm talking about here, it's not because we want the attention or something, taking attention away from God. But it's in the sense of, this involves me. This involves you. We're not just watching something happen up here as if we're spectators in a theater or uh, fans at a sporting event or something. What goes on here has everything to do with what goes on here. What happens at the altar involves me, involves you. Not like an observer or a bystander. Not like a passive spectator. And we're not just remembering something from 2,000 years ago and thinking about it in our heads. But we, in that Eucharistic prayer, are involved in an encounter with God through and with and in Jesus Christ. An encounter that involves us personally, as individuals, as a parish, as members of the parish. It's a personal commitment that we make in that prayer, not just an affirmation of some abstract truth. So it's about us in the sense that it invites a commitment from us. As in Mary's, may it be done unto me. Amen. We surrender ourselves. We sacrifice ourselves. We give ourselves to God. And that sacrifice on any particular Sunday might be something really big going on in your individual life, or your family's life, or the life of the parish. Or it might be something small. It doesn't matter. It's all part of the sacrifice we offer. So some weeks it might be something very difficult, something wrenching, uh, like a serious illness. Uh, for you or someone in your family or neighborhood, something tragic that happened in your family, um, death of loved ones, or sometimes what we offer some Sundays, it's something real simple. I got up and went to work again. I made dinner again. Um, taking care of those we love, fulfilling our responsibilities at home, at work, doing something like paying the bills or doing your homework, listening to our family members if they want to talk sometimes when we're too tired and ready to go to bed. I used to think um, when my girls were teenagers, <laughs> the time, usually they were pretty quiet, but the time they usually wanted to talk was when they'd come home at night from something, and I'm in bed reading and I'm ready to go to sleep, and they want to tell me all about something that happened that evening, and I'm thinking, why couldn't you do that sometime during the day when I'm awake and ready to listen? But you know, if a teenager wants to talk, better shut up and listen right then because that might not come, we might not get the chance again for a while. So anyway, and I'm thinking too, like listening to your parents, whether you're a teenager yourself, listening to your parents. Or if you have elderly parents sometimes, um, uh, my mom lives in a, a retirement home and she sees people at dinner time, but I think she spends a lot of the day by herself. So when you call her, she has a lot to say because she hasn't talked to anybody all day. Um, so even just something like that, just making a phone call and listening. So our sacrifice that we offer, it might be something um, huge and difficult. It might be just the mundane events of our lives. But that's all part of what we offer to God in the Eucharistic prayer. We offer our past week, things that have happened to us. And the fact that we make the offering is also a promise or a pledge we give to God for how we're going to live and offer ourselves in the coming week. 
we offer you in thanksgiving this holy and living sacrifice. Amen. We say. Through and with and in Christ, we offer thanks, we offer ourselves as a holy and living sacrifice, and we say amen to that. Yes, here I am, Lord. May it be done unto me. There's another important amen that happens. What we just talked about was the Eucharistic prayer. There's another important amen that happens in the communion rite. When we come forward to receive communion, we're told the body of Christ, the blood of Christ, and we say amen. amen. We have that amen there. <clears throat> so no sooner do we offer ourselves to God in the Eucharistic prayer, with that prayer of thanks, with Christ, with the bread and wine, then God takes that gift and gives it right back to us again. It's like God just cannot be outdone in generosity. As soon as we give to God, he gives right back to us. But he changes that bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ. The words that we hear at the distribution of communion, the body of Christ, the blood of Christ, it is an announcement of the gracious love of God, God's love poured out for us in Jesus Christ. Here is the one who loves us so much that he gave his life for us. Here is the very presence of the one who cherishes us so much that he has become our food. So often we interpret that dialogue at the distribution of communion, the body of Christ, the blood of Christ, amen. We interpret that as an affirmation of our belief in the real presence of Christ in that bread and wine, now consecrated the body and blood of Christ, amen. We interpret that as, do you believe that this is really the true body and blood of Christ? Yes, I believe, amen. And that is certainly part of what's happening in that dialogue. But I would like to say there's a little bit more happening uh, in addition to that as well. Our amen there is not only affirming our belief in the real presence of Christ in the consecrated bread and wine, but it's also a commitment, a promise, again, to give our lives like Jesus did. And we can get some insight about this from um, the Gospel accounts of the Last Supper. We hear that story of the Last Supper in the middle of the Eucharistic prayer at every Mass, where Jesus takes the bread, blesses it, breaks it, gives it to the disciples and says, this is my body. In that action, he sums up the meaning of his whole life and the meaning of his death, which he knew was imminent. His life is given for others. His body would be broken on the cross like bread, broken though so that others might live. He identifies himself with this bread, with food. On one level, I think saying, Food is our nourishment. We need food to live. And that's what Christ is for us. We need him to live. He's our nourishment, our sustenance. He's what sustains us. He identifies himself, what Jesus does, with this meal. And what do meals do? One thing they do is bring us together. You know how important that is for family life. Also important for friends and extended family to get together around a meal. So Jesus is being... Uh, talking about himself as being the source of unity, he identifies himself with this food, with this meal. The meal also has to do with self-gift. Um, I always think of uh, the time that it takes to prepare uh, supper for your family. So you have to think of what you're going to make. You have to go to the store and get it. You have to prepare it all and have it ready at the same time, put it on the table. Of course, it takes like 10 minutes for everybody to eat, right? Um, so so what you, the effort you put in wasn't for the sake of the meal itself, was it? Not so everybody could say, isn't that a nice good meal? It's so that people eat. So the meal is, is not there for itself, but to feed others. And so Christ is saying, I'm like that food. I don't exist for my own self. I exist for the sake of others that they might live. 
So just as that bread at the Last Supper was taken and blessed and broken and given, so Christ's body will be broken on the cross that all might live. And after supper, he took a cup, again gave thanks and praise, and said, This cup is the cup of my blood. His blood poured out on the cross for the sake of us all. A, a sense of not holding anything back, but just letting himself be totally spent, totally given for the life of the world. After Jesus says those things, this is my body, this is my blood, then he says the one line that's always quoted at the end of the story uh, that's told in the Last Supper. Do this in memory of me. Now I think we often interpret that line as have mass. Do this with the bread and wine in memory of me. But there's another level to that saying as well. And you can get um, a, a sense of that from looking at John's Gospel. The Gospel of John, when John writes about the Last Supper, he doesn't say anything about bread and wine, surprisingly enough. But Jesus does another action in John's Gospel at the Last Supper, which I'm you probably can think of. What does Jesus do with his disciples in action he does with them at the Last Supper in John's Gospel? The foot washing. He washes mm -hmm. their feet. He gets down on the floor and he washes their feet. And at the end of that, what does he say? Copy what I have done. I wash your feet, you wash others' feet. He makes it real clear that what he did in service his followers are supposed to do in service of others. And I think that's what the do this in memory of me means too in the other gospel. It means just as Jesus let his body be broken on the cross for the sake of others, so we should be bread broken in service of others. Just as Jesus' blood was poured out, so we should let ourselves be poured out in service of others. So to do this in memory of me doesn't mean just take the bread and wine, bless it, break and give it out, but to let ourselves be broken and poured out by Christ. So when we say amen to that, that's another dangerous thing we're saying, isn't it? Another promise we make. When we receive communion, we make that promise, that pledge, amen, let it be done unto me, that we too will be the body of Christ broken for the world, the blood of Christ poured out in service of others. I will give of myself like food to nourish others, amen. I will pour myself out in love, again, maybe in big dramatic ways in your life, maybe in simple ways again, going to school, doing your work. But in all these ways, we continue Christ's self-giving so that it's no longer I who live, as St. Paul said, but Christ who lives in us. Like Mary, we say, may it be done unto me according to your word. When we say that amen at communion, it's never just a matter of each of us individually saying it. We say it as a community, don't we? We each come forward in procession, one by one, amen, amen, amen. We receive the body of Christ in order to become, to be the body of Christ. <coughs> St. Augustine was a, uh, one of the best theologians of the church's uh, first thousand years. He was also a bishop in North Africa. And he has um, a quotation that's, it's been around a lot in the last 10 or 20 years, but I, I'd like to just read this again because it has so much to say about what we say amen to. Um, and he has a comment about that amen at the end. If you want to understand the body of Christ, listen to what the Apostle Paul says to the faithful. You are the body of Christ, member for member. You are Christ's own body, his members. Thus, it is your own mystery that is placed on the table. It is your own mystery that you receive. For at communion, 
and the priest says, the body of Christ, and you reply, Amen. When you say, Amen, you are saying yes to what you are. Isn't that a great line? When you say, Amen, you are saying yes to what you are. So it, it, it is definitely an affirmation of your belief in the real presence of Christ in the consecrated bread and wine. But it's also a commitment. Saying amen, saying yes to what you are as the body of Christ. And when we say that amen at communion, we make a gesture. What's the gesture of reverence that we do now when we receive communion? The body of Christ. We bow our heads. We bow our heads. That's the gesture of reverence for the churches in the United States. Um, sometimes you see people make a profound bow from the waist, but that's not the bow for communion. It's about the head. The profound bow is the bow you make in reverence to the altar. That bow is a gesture of reverence, acknowledging the presence of Christ and the consecrated bread and wine. But just think with me for a minute, what else does that feel like? Or what else might we find in that gesture, that bow of the head? I'm thinking a nod of agreement, the body of Christ saying yes to what we are, an acceptance, uh, may it be done to me according to your word. Sometimes we nod like that when we're listening to someone, to say, I hear you, I understand. And so we make that gesture, we're hearing what's being said to us. Be a member of the body of Christ, pour yourself out for others. Yes, we're listening, we hear that. I think of it too, it reminds me of, um, and I probably get this from movies or TV, it reminds me of a person who would be um, maybe a soldier, uh, or maybe a servant, somebody that has to obey someone else who's in authority over them. Um, so I'm thinking like, I don't know what, the servants on Downton Abbey, if you watch that show or some other thing, you're given some instructions, some orders that you have to do, maybe a, a bow to acknowledge, I heard it, and I will do it. And we're saying that too, aren't we, in the, uh, in the, university, in the community time. Oh, there's a reading, um, on Thursday, uh, the reading for Thursday of the third week of Lent, has God um, angry with the people of Israel because they haven't been listening and doing what he says, and he calls them a stiff-necked people. I am going to do my way, stiff-necked people. So what do we say? When we're bowing our head at communion, we're saying we don't want to be a stiff-necked people. We're going to bow our head. So in communion, we have an encounter with Christ where he's asking us, do you believe that I, the risen Christ, the living Christ, am present in this bread and wine? Amen. Yes, I do. Will you follow me and let yourself be broken and poured out for others? Amen. Let it be done to me. Will you become more and more what you became in baptism, what you affirm in the sacrament of reconciliation? That you're a member of Christ's body, serving others in the world as one with your brothers and sisters? Amen. We say yes to what we are. Yes, here I am, Lord, I come to do your will. After Mary's response, let it be, that Annunciation passage quickly concludes. Then the angel departed from her. Real short. That's how Mass ends, too. The concluding rites are very simple, very brief. We have a blessing and a dismissal. Simple, but again, full of meaning, like all our sacraments. We're sent to go out and live the way that we've worshipped. If we worshipped as one body, gathered as one, in the greeting when we was revealed the mystery of the gathered church, then we go out to live that way, in unity with one another. If we've been open and attentive to God's word, receptive to what God has to say to us through the scripture readings, we go out to our lives to listen to God speak to us through our family, our friends, the newspaper, our conscience, 
whatever ways that God is speaking to us. If we were able to say yes, amen, to the Eucharistic prayer and to communion, we go out to say yes to God in the circumstances of our lives. We're sent to go out and love and serve the Lord in our everyday acts of kindness and love and service of others. That was a little longer than the other ones, wasn't it? I thought it was going to be shorter. Um, we'll pray in a couple minutes, but again, like the other nights, maybe you might take a moment and just think about uh, one thing or other that might have caught your attention or stood out to you uh, from the presentation, and maybe talk about that with one or two other people that are sitting near you. And then we'll have about a 10 minute or so prayer service.
God forever. Blessed be God forever. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, you live among us in the sacrament of your body and blood. May we offer to our Father in heaven a solemn pledge of undivided love. May we offer to our brothers and sisters a life poured out in loving service of that kingdom where you live with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen.
to a virgin betrothed to a man named Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And coming to her, he said, Hail, full of grace, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at what was said, and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of David, his father. And he will rule over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. But Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I have no relations with a man? And the angel said to her in reply, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month for her, who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible for God. Mary said, Behold, I am the handmaid of the Lord. May it be done to me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Let us now pray for our needs and the needs of our world.
Once again, before we go, a couple of words of thanks. To begin with, I want to offer a word of thanks to Kathy Reinhardt, who really is the coordinator of our whole mission effort. She's worked together with, um, with Nancy Courtney, with Carol Hammer. Um, anybody else from your group? Sorry? Sister Marsha, surely. So um, please do join me in giving them uh, our appreciation because of the Marsha and to the choir and all the cantors, as well as the readers, uh, Jocelyn on Sunday night and Irvin last night, uh, Dana tonight. Word of thanks to Steve Kimmett, who's been videotaping the whole thing so that we can have it available online on our parish website. So friends or those maybe who haven't been able to join us can see it, or if you want to be refreshed, you can go online and see it that way. A um, particular word of thanks to Sister Marsha and the choir who've been down here tonight, which is very, very different for them. They had a liturgy workshop uh, not so long ago where they learned and studied some of the things about cantering and all that. And so they're applying some of the things that they learned about liturgy too. So hopefully the things that we've learned in these last couple of days about the sacraments, we can begin to practice too in our own daily lives. And last but not least, please do join me in thanking Emily Bessel for her leadership. Join us tomorrow night, 7 o'clock, right here in church. We'll celebrate liturgy around the table of the Lord. There'll also be a, a time of refreshment afterwards that we haven't had these other nights. So we'll go on over to the, uh, to the parish hall for a time of fellowship and refreshment. So if you're planning babysitters or things like that, just know that it'll be a little, there'll be a little time of fellowship following our liturgy tomorrow. May the Lord bless us. Protect us from all evil and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Amen. Go in peace. Thanks be to God. Let us offer one another a sign of Christ's peace.
situé.